Hello, everyone. Welcome to Voices of the Nakba, a living history of Palestine at the 2022 Cambridge Festival. It's a real pleasure to have all of you here. Um, and thank you for your patience as we get some of the technology uh, sorted. My name is Mazna Cato, and I'm a research fellow at Newnham College at the University of Cambridge. Alongside, um, alongside Ya'il Navarro, Hannah Morgenstern, and Mabish Ahmed, I co-convened the Archives of the Disappeared Research Initiative based at the Margaret Anstey Center at Newnham College and the Center for Research in the Arts, Social Sciences and Humanities at Cambridge. Archives of the Disappeared is an interdisciplinary research initiative for the study and documentation of communities, social movements, spaces, life worlds, literatures and cultures that have been destroyed through acts of political repression and mass violence. Through a reading group, seminars and master classes, as well as lectures by scholars, artists, archivists, and community activists, the initiative explores the question of archive in the context of annihilation. To that end, we're incredibly delighted to be joined today by Diana Allen, Rosemary Sayer, Mahmoud Zaydan, Leila Parsons, Alex Winder, and Huda Adra in conversation on a very exciting new edited collection, Voices of the Nakba, A Living History of Palestine, published by Pluto Books. I'm going to start off by introducing Diana Allen, who, co -edit, who edited this volume, um, and hand it over to her as we um, hear from our wonderful um, contributors. Um, and then we're hopefully going to open it up for a, uh, uh, a loose-ended conversation on the themes addressed in the volume, as well as other thoughts more broadly on um, oral history, on the Nakba and its documentation. Uh, Diana is an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology and in the Institute of International Development Studies at McGill University. She's a filmmaker and the co-founder of the Nakba Archive, which by the way, was one of the first events we, um, one of the first archives we addressed in Archives That Disappeared, almost three years ago. So it's an incredible uh, delight and honor to have her with us today. Her ethnography, Refugees of the Revolution, Experiences of Palestinian Exile, was published by Stanford University Press in 2014 and won the MIMO Palestine Academic Book Award and the American Anthropological Association Middle East Section Award in 2015. We're incredibly delighted to have you with us, Diana, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Mesna. It's really um, an honor to be here. And um, thank you also to Yael and um, to, to Crash and to the Archive, um, Archives for the Disappeared Project for giving us this opportunity to speak a bit about Voices of the Nakba um, and also the archival project, the Nakba Archive on which it, it builds. I'm going to uh, share my screen. Um, there we go. Um, so, uh, let me just close that. Um, so yes, we're really we're really thrilled to be uh, joining you today, and um, I'm also just I'm really happy that we have the we have some of the contributors with us that we have um, Mahmoud and Leila and Alex and Rosemary Sai, uh, who who this book is dedicated to, whose whose work has been so pivotal. Uh, to the development of Palestinian oral history. Um, and I'm also really happy to have, have Huda Adra, who, who translated many of the interviews uh, in this collection. And um, the voices that echo through this work are really alive uh, in the writing, thanks to the extraordinary work that she and others have done. Um, I think the challenge of rendering Palestinian vernacular with all its unique rhythms of thought and emotion vitally and vividly in English um, you know, it, it involves not only reproducing the particular modes of Palestinian oral expressivity in another language, but also conveying um, the sense of intimacy and effective force of, of the oral and the spoken encounter in textual form. And that's a really, you know, a very hard thing to do. So um, the work that she's done has, has, has been really enormously important. Um, 
I think what what writing, including scholarly writing, can learn from oral experience will be, you know, the subject of my of my brief remarks today. Um, the lessons it should learn are not just factual and historical in the conventional sense, but also formal and technical and epistemological. At the heart of this book is an understanding of oral history as referring not just to how events are recorded, but also how they're experienced. Um, before I turn over to my, my co-panelists, I'm, I'm going to just say a few things um, about, about, about the book um, and, and the archive, this, this uh, collection of oral testimonies that are both uh, the inspiration and source for this book. So the Nakba Archive is a is an oral is an oral a oral history project, a grassroots oral history project. It's it's audiovisual, so the the testimonies were recorded on film, um, with and recorded with first generation Palestinian refugees in camps and cities across Lebanon. And the focus of this of this archive um, is the experience of the 1948 uprooting during the events that led to the creation of the State of Israel. Um, this project was led by Mahmi, by me and Mahmoud Zaydan. Um, and we started recording interviews with elders in the camps and informal gatherings around uh, Lebanon in 2002. And we were working sort of until 2008, although we still continue to, to do occasional um, recordings. And, and I began working on this project in the context of my own doctoral um, Shatila camp. And over the course of around, you know, five, five or so years, we, we managed to record over 500 interviews. Um, and in 2010, the collection of interviews was given to the Palestinian Oral History Archive at the American University of Beirut, which redigitized and indexed it and made the interviews uh, searchable by key terms, which is also an amazing um, contribution to this project. And this collection was then launched as an open access virtual archive in 2019. And our hope is that people who read this book will go back to these, you know, to, to the interviews and watch them. And all the interviews that are, uh, the, the 30 interviews that are collected in this volume have been subtitled. Uh, so those will be, will also be, um, you know, available for, for non-Arabic um, speakers. Um, so, this is a slide of uh, Deeb Maspar, who's one of the people that we interviewed, um, and, and Mahmoud gathering documents. So in, the, in, the, in, in recording these accounts and, and gathering um, and scanning refugee photographs and documents, our goal was to turn from the colonial machinations that produce the events of uh, the expulsion to kind of turn away from those towards the, an experiential understanding of their unfolding and attending to in particular how histories of the Nakba has, have been experienced um, by generations of refugees. For refugees in the camps in Lebanon, the Nakba is obviously not simply a historical event, but an ongoing condition um, of their existence. Um, this is some mandate uh documents as well just i'm just gonna i'm just in, incorporating images so that it gives you a sense of kind of the materiality of the collection too um in the in the historiography of the modern middle east uh the palestinian expulsion uh refugee narratives have, have continued to occupy a marginal place and this is both in zionist histories and in revisionist works Israel's founding continues to kind of take narrative pre precedence over Palestine's destruction. And there are very few studies of the Nakba that have been really driven primarily by ordinary accounts of, of, of ordinary civilians. And in a sense, a definitive history of the 1948 up, um, uprooting as told by Palestinians has yet to be written. In general, the oral accounts of refugee elders in camp communities have been viewed, I think, with wariness uh, by scholars of Palestine. Um, they're seen as unreliable and uh, yeah. liability, um, and also a kind of a, reputa a reputational threat to Palestinian mm. scholarship. This distrust of oral sources has been, I think, particularly costly for our understanding of what took place in 1948, since the majority of, of Palestinians who were forcibly displaced were peasants who could neither read nor write and who've left no memoirs or written record. Um, and in a sense, the exclusion of refugee accounts from, his, from the historical record has essentially placed them, uh, placed the experiences of camp communities outside of the historical frame. 
advocates of oral history have argued that it can fill gaps in the historical record and shed light on subaltern experience and challenge settler colonial narratives. But I think what is 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 less, you know, less frequently considered is how refugee narratives might transform our understanding of history itself, its its form, its substance, its purpose, and, and the matter of who tells it. From the beginning, uh, the Nakba archive and this book, which has grown from it, has been interested in oral accounts, not simply as a source and a supplement for historiography, but as a unique form of history in its own right. Um, the particularities of oral forms, those characteristics are often sort of viewed as, um, you know, a liability. Uh, we've approached those as, as uniquely valuable for under, understanding uh, not only the details of what took place, but also how these events were experienced and how they continue to shape refugee lives today. Um, so, you know, in thinking, you know, thinking about the value of uh, subjective and the sort of fluid qualities of oral accounts, the porousness of, of oral history, its malleability, its tenacity, um, where oral narratives themselves have come to kind of constitute a kind of archive and kind of thinking about, about um, narrative forms as, 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 a, as a sort of archive. Um, thinking also about the social and cultural dynamics of oral performance and their proximity to other um, poetic and lyrical genres, to laments, to ataba, to song, um, and the particular forms of expressivity and emotion, both verbal and nonverbal, uh, carry and obviously this is something that is visible you know in the in the, in the um, recorded the recorded testimonies um, and also thinking about the dialogic form of oral narratives which have been sustained through a rich culture of transmission and reception of, of speaking and listening um, which has been passed down through families and through communities and so in the sense we approach refugee narratives not as a place of last resort but as a place of first interest and um, a subject of study in and of itself. This is a, um, a picture of, our, of, the, of the website, which is in the process of being um, rebuilt. Um, so the book, just to turn to the book, the book uh, has um, 13 chapters, each of which uh, includes a short essay written from a range of disciplinary perspectives, which provides some context and analysis um, and then these are these sort of introduce a number of, of interview excerpts. We ended we ended up including extended interview excerpts. So each chapter has around you know five or six thousand words of translated interview, um, and we chose to to include very long excerpts as opposed to sort of shorter interspersed passages, because we really felt that it was important to preserve the integrity of voice and and the rhythms of recollection. Um, and I think Huda is going to probably talk a little bit more about that also. Um, we also tried to preserve this, the di dialogic qualities of refugee nar narratives in the book's form. Um, it's in its multivocal form, which uh, consciously tries to extend the setting of the interview. So we have, you know, the interviewers posing questions, subjects responding, authors, contributors listening and commenting. Um, a kind of, in a sense, extending the conversation. And at the heart are the voices, obviously, of elders whose stories have, in turn, be, been fed by the voices of their parents and their grandparents, um, the experience of Palestinian life in exile, um, which, which has been sustained by these histories of um, speaking and listening. So we have, we have these voices that are braided together, the voices of the interview, interviewees braided with the interviewers and the translators, and, um, and then those of the scholars and commentators. And I think the book is also in, implicitly uh, an invitation to readers to think, um, you know, to engage in, in acts of empathetic listening and engagement, and to think critically about the forms of complicit indifference that have contributed to the plight and injustice that the Palestinian refugees um, experience. Uh, last week, we uh, gave, a, gave a presentation on the book uh, at the People's Forum in New York, and, and Mahmoud referred to the book as a missed call, which I really like, um, because I think uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a very, it's a very apt description. It's, it's kind of in the way that it kind of points to, I think, how we see this book as, as a kind of an alert, as a reminder, um, as an interruption of, of some sort. Broadly speaking, the aims of this book are, you know, at the most li literal level to introduce readers 
uh, to the value of, of oral narratives to the collection, the collection of the Nakba archive and the value of these refugee narratives for understanding um, the, the disasters of 1948 um, and the dispossession and dismantling of Palestinian life that also that began decades before 1948 uh, at the hands of Zionist settlers and as a result of uh, British colonial rule in Palestine. It's also an attempt to pay tribute to the extraordinary resilience of Palestinian refugee communities in Lebanon and celebrates refugee narrators as authoritative chroniclers of their own history. Um, and it documents the events of 1948 um, through these first person accounts of, of elders who lived through these events. Um, it is also an attempt to highlight the legacy, legacies of settler colonialism and the prescriptive power of Zionist narratives which have sought to erase the foundational violence of state making um, and, the, and the experience of ongoing Palestinian expulsion and dispossession. And, and it's very striking that the accounts um, of Palestinians who were expelled from their homes in Sheikh Jarrah uh, in East Jerusalem last year echo many of the testimonies gathered in this collection. So we feel this kind of, um, you know, the ongoing force and relevance of these stories today. And our hope is that this book will also open up new and critical lines of inquiry as to what took place in 1948 and under, underscore the, the sort of uniquely valuable, valuable contributions of refugee accounts for understanding the enduring structural dynamics of Israeli settler colonialism. Um, I think a community-driven project of this sort that gathers and preserves refugee testimonies raises really critical questions that are methodological, ethno-political. Um, what are the implications of institutionalizing something that has lived outside of institutional settings and in, in many respects has survived in spite of them? Um, in the rush to gather and hold and tra transcribe and translate what, what might be lost. Um, how do you archive something that is experientially dependent, where social and performative dynamics like tone and gesture and embodied form are really critically important for understanding meaning and how do we, how do we do, so how do we kind of convey that in, in text and what does it mean to document these spoken histories um, that are understood to be temporally experienced uh, and generationally finite. Um, so these have been kind of motivating questions um, that also, I think, introduce unique opportunities for rethinking what form an archive of exilic life might take and, and what it might become. Uh, and in this sense, the book's subject is the living archive of Palestinian refugee experience, living in the sense of being protean and generational and vital and vulnerable. Um, and to insist that these histories also are not past, but that they speak forcefully to a political present um, is also to, to imagine the archive as living and camps themselves as a form of archive where histories of displacement and dispossession have been lived and held. An archive built from refugee accounts is one that in a sense has existed in these storied worlds of camps, the living changing repositories of Nakba experience. Um, I want to just end by introducing my long-term collaborator, Mahmoud Zaydan, by reading I think my favorite passage um, in this book, which is drawn from the preface that he wrote, which describes Ein al the camp in which he grew up in South Lebanon, as a storied space where histories of the Nakba were environmental and atmospheric, absorbed through the senses, part of the air he breathed when he was growing up. And he writes, these stories thrummed the tents of the camps and flew like driving rain. They hung in the air in later years amid, among tin houses, spreading like the scent of food and attracting neighbors, relatives, and passers-by. Uh, and, and Mahmoud wrote this early on in the process of, of working on this book, and it's remained for me a kind of lodestar um, in the book's composition, um, which, which in some sense aims to be continuous with that thrumming and driving and hanging and spreading and attracting with the world of, of vocal braiding and transformation. So I'm gonna pass on to Mahmoud, um, who then will pass on, I think, Hello. to others. Hello, thank you, Diana. Thank you, Ms. Na. Uh, let me clarify something confusing about the name. I just realized it because I, uh, I appeared as Jabir Suleiman. Uh, maybe some of you have already known Jabir and they might be confused more. I'm not Jabir, but uh, <laughs> this is, uh, I, I helped him to access a, a, a webinar before and uh, I had to use uh, the 
use my laptop, so his name is still there. I had troubles accessing this uh, meeting, so his name is still there. I am Mahmoud Zaidan, as Diana put it, uh, Palestinian refugee living in Lebanon. Let me first uh, start by thanking Ms. Nan and everybody for being here and giving time uh, and express my gratitude and appreciation for having you all here and the special invaluable thanks to Rosemary. This is a real privilege. Thank you, Rosemary, for being here. We're so happy to see you again. Thank you. Uh, I, I will just speak maybe for five, three minutes. I cannot add to what Diana has said, but maybe I can uh, speak uh, just shortly about uh, uh, oral history in, in, in general in the Palestinian context. And I can uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, the archive or the collection of the Nakba archive and then the, the book, as Diana described it in details, can, can give a mo modest uh, overview of the, of the archive. So as, as most of you know about the Palestinian refugees in Lebanon and Palestinian refugees in general, uh, whose voices were unheard or sometimes silenced or, or marginalized, we found in oral history a kind of tool of expression and, and, and representation because it gives voices to ordinary people who either don't read or write or even didn't have a chance to speak. And as you know, most of the Palestinian refugees were farmers and peasants and people who might have little access to schooling or to, uh, uh, let's say, media or to uh, uh, to, to be heard. So uh, uh, in, in this term, I think oral history gave sort of justice for, for Palestinian refugees. As I wrote in the preface, like before this uh, uh, archive, before the Nakba archive and before the book, we have our own archives as refugees living in the camp. We uh, are exposed to these stories from parents, from friends, from relatives, neighbors, because history lived with us in the camp. And again, on other different forms that uh, were sh shown by Diana, like photos or diaries, I always give that these uh, uh, remnants or these, uh, let's say, documents survive exile like us because they live with us. And I always like to give this example when once we had a photo of one of the refugees having it in his pocket money all the time. So it was not only wrinkled, but uh, it absorbed, it absorbed, let's say, sweat. And it, it is like uh, fainting because it is with him everywhere. If he is having multiple displacement or if he's, let's say, sleeping or if he's working, these photos uh, or this photo did not uh, uh, depart his pocket money. And again, like the photos that we've seen in living rooms or in frames in, in houses, uh, they were uh, also... Uh, uh, <laughs> sorry, because this is iftar time, you know, we are passing and uh, they are checking on me. Sorry for interruption. So these, these images that, for example, were in living rooms, they experienced destruction and they experienced, as I said, invasion and they experienced exile exactly like us. So this is the, the, the history of Palestinian refugees. It's a history of refugees. It's a history of exile. It's a, it's, it's a history of, of suffering because it experienced liquidation and silencing. And as you know, like, because it hasn't been written, it hasn't been heard. So we heard it, we lived with it, we know it. And as I said, I myself heard stories of my village, of staff from my father, from neighbors. But later on, I had my own stories because I survived the Israeli invasion in 1982, the war of the camps, the uh, wars in East Saida, and, and 
I experienced a multiple uh, series of, of, of displacement during my uh, uh, university uh, uh, life. So these uh, uh, personal, if you want, experiences were overlapping of or over over the histories of my parents and my, my my grandparents and my neighbors. So then we started to ask these big questions: Why we are experiencing all this? Why we are in refugee camps? Why we are not allowed to return? Why and and the search for stories and for documentation became more, if you want, insisting on more more important for me. And I started documenting and collecting stories from the village, uh, diaries and uh, photos. And later, as I said, 20 years ago, then I met and I was so lucky. I was so lucky to. I was so lucky to meet Diana and then start working on the Nakba archive. The first challenge was we we were listening to stories without the questions because people talk and then we started to build the questionnaires we want to do questions and we wanted to find people who were like uh, meeting some criteria like age uh, ability to remember and having experience and we did not think that sometimes people don't want to speak or they were let's say uh, 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 traumatized or they don't like to share their experiences and we were in front of the questions ourselves from refugees and from uh, narrators asking why now where are you going to take this etc so it wasn't that easy but at the end of the day as i said we managed to collect this marvelous archive that has more than 500 interviews and around 1000 hours of of of, of recordings from different like villages of Palestine that exist in Lebanon. So again, the book uh, uh, aimed to give an idea to the uh, uh, audience about the archive, about these experiences. The archive is very rich. And I think I will close here that there is urgent need for further excavation for refugees archives and narratives that are dispersed and, and spread all over and preserve them in one place to be accessible in order to, uh, let's say, justify or uh, 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 give some, some justice for, for the victims of Nakba after 74 years. Thank you, and uh, I will be happy if there is uh, uh, any question for things that uh, uh, I didn't cover or say. Thank you again all for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mahmoud. Um, Rosemary, and, and, and we, we will have a, I'm sure there's quite a few questions that people will have afterwards. Um, next, I'd like uh, Rose, is Rosemary Sayer? Is she here? Yeah. Um, Rosemary Sayer. I'm here, but I've got my text in front of me now instead of the people. Uh, that's okay, that's okay. But I wanted to give you your flowers properly oh. and, and say we are so incredibly honored and delighted to have you with us today. Um, you have been a lodestar and a guiding light on oral history and in particular on Palestinian his oral history for so long and has challenged us, particularly the historians among us as well as many others on what is, um, what is an archive whose voices matter, and so many other questions around method and research and um, obligation and commitment. Um, Rosemary Sayer is an oral historian, anthropologist, and the author of groundbreaking books, including Palestinians from Presence to Revolutionaries, published in 1979, Too Many Enemies, The Palestinian Experience in Lebanon, and um, voices, Palestinian women narrate displacement. And for a long while, she was visiting lecturer at the Center for Arab and Middle Eastern Studies at the AUB. Um, we're so incredibly glad to have you with us today, Rosemary, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Mazna. I'm afraid I have a, a very puny record academically in comparison with the other speakers. I've always been more of a writer than a 
than, a, than an academic. Uh, and uh, this has been my privilege, I think, not to have had to really have a profession. Anyway, to get on with what um, I wanted to say, like all of us here, I'm, I'm, I'm here tonight to celebrate Diana Allen's Voices of the Nekba, a study based on systematic recording, recording of the experiences of Palestinians expelled by Israel in 1948. If it weren't for her work, the academic and political worlds would be even more ignorant of the realities of the Nekba than they actually are. In her hands, oral history shows itself a highly appropriate tool for people who have been removed from their lands by superior military force to register their history, experiences, and their claims. In Diana's book, Palestinian refugees cease to be casualty statistics of a long ago war and become people faced with face fateful choices to stay or leave, where to go, what to take. Through voices of the Nekba, we can imagine the panic that makes a woman pick up a pillow instead of her baby. We can imagine the fear that drives a family to leave a fully cooked meal on the stove. These were people who, when shelling and bombing on them began, hadn't been prepared for war and didn't have leadership or any news sources except for maybe a single cafe radio. The 1948 erasure of, erasure of Palestine from the map was an event that could not but have important continuous and far re reaching repercussions. This was a country with a 4,000 year history as a named geopolitical entity. Though Palestine had been part of the Ottoman Empire since the 16th century and had been occupied by Britain since 1917, it had a historically formed population, historical boundaries, and a distinct history, both written and oral. Israel's expul expulsion in 1948 of an estimated three quarters of Palestine's indigenous population was termed by them the Nekba catastrophe. As Noor Masalha writes, the ethnic cleansing of Palestine and the traumatic rupture of 1948 are central both to Palestinian society of today and Palestinian history and collective identity. In spite of the centrality of the Nakba to subsequent Palestinian history, attempts to record it through the memories of those who experienced it have been scattered and discontinuous. Even after the establishment of national research and publishing institutions in the 1960s, recording Nekba experiences was not seen as a priority. When Berzik when University historian Saleh Abdul Zawad submitted a proposal for the recording of Nekba memories to the Institute of Palestine Studies, he did not find support. Though using Birzeit resources and oral history methods, he was able to record the destruction of certain West Bank villages. In London, Suleiman Mansour created his own commemoration site, Palestine Remembered, with multiple oral testimonies. Other small collections exist in refugee camps. Through dedicated persistence, Diana Allen, in collaboration with Mahmoud Zaydan, has been able to create what I think is, I can say, the best collection of Nekba stories, though limited to the Palestinians in Lebanon. Because of its combination of oral and visual evidence, its accessibility through internet, and now as a book, Voices of the Nekba, will reach university lecturers and libraries throughout the world. However, rather than commenting on the excellences of Voice of the Nekba, I have chosen to speak about another oral historian who worked with Palestinian refugees, but whose name may not be familiar to you. I want to commemorate Nafiz Nazal, whose book, The Palestinian Exodus from Galilee, 1948, was published in 1978 and was thus 
the first attempt to use oral history to record the Nekva. His study was actually undertaken in 1973, 20 25 years after the Nekba, when many people who had lived through the Nekba were still alive. He interviewed 111 refugees from 32 Galilean villages and towns. He had an interview schedule, but didn't use it when recording informants, taking notes and writing full text from memory at night, a good way of minima minimizing class distinction between interviewer and interviewee. The absence of a tape recorder would also have increased interviewer, inter, sorry, interviewee confidence. Nafiz records atrocities that I haven't seen detailed in any other accounts. In Aina Zaytun near Safed, a Palmach unit surrounded the village, divided the men from the women, then chose 37 Teenager boys, they were never seen again. The rest were ordered to leave the village. A few men who tried to return were shot dead. Albasa was a village that had friendly relations with the nearby Jewish settlement of Masub and did not expect to be attacked. However, on May 14th, the Zionists attacked and most people left. As was normal, old people didn't leave expecting, um, sorry, lost a bit, expecting according to traditional Arab rules of warfare to be spared. But when Mahmoud Duhi infiltrated back to bring his mother, he found her body burnt. It should be not noted here that Salman Abu Siti has compiled, compiled a detailed record of the fate of every single Palestinian town and village during 1948. It's called the Palestinian Nekba 1948, the register of depopulated localities in Palestine, date 2000. Nazar reports on each village in Northern Galilee, quoting from former residents. Towards the end of the war, the Zionists began to use aerial bombardment. A resident of Safaria reports, Three Gen Jewish planes flew over the village and dropped barrels filled with explosives, metal fragments, nails and glass. They shook the whole village, broke windows, doors, killed and wounded some of the villagers and many of the village livestock. In Mesh al Karum, Im Abed al Kiblawi recalls, Jewish soldiers picked 12 of our men at random, blindfolded them, and shot them in front of us. In Safsaf, Im Shahadi al Salih describes as we lined up, a few Jewish soldiers, soldiers ordered four girls to accompany them to carry water for the soldiers. Instead, they took them to our empty houses and raped them. About 70 of our men were blindfolded and shot to death, one after the other, in front of us. Incidentally, this atrocity was confirmed years later through a contemporary report from a neighboring Jewish settlement that was published in Haaretz. Nafiz Nazal painstakingly follows the war stories of Aina Zaytun, Safed, Nazareth, Lubia, Hittin, Shab, Masjid al Kurum, Al Birwi, Safsaf, Tarshiha, Akbara, Kabri and most other locations of Galilee, using interviews with local rev residents whom he sought out in refugee camps in Lebanon. Though not presented on the under the title of oral history, his study exemplifies oral history's effectiveness in bringing into expression the thoughts, feelings, and actions of a rural people deprived of leadership and faced with sudden military attack. His long quotation of Imrad, I'm sorry, Imsad Rari's story of escaping from Kabri, during which Zionist soldiers stole her jewelry and killed her husband, gives a telling picture of how, alone and far from her village, her main concern was to bury her husband in the proper way. He quotes her, until today, I worry and pray that I buried him in the proper position. 
Though limited in its coverage to one district of Palestine, Nazar's study yet offers a well-substantiated multivocal account of how the Zionist forces emptied the country of its mainly rural population. As Rashid Khalidi writes in his foreword, this book, quote, provides irrefutable evidence that the foundation of the state of Israel was accompanied by, and indeed conditional upon, the wholesale expulsion of the Palestinian Arab majority of the population from their homes and pro property. Yet in spite of its authenticity and historical value, a source on experiences of Nekba, Nazar's study is seldom referred to in histories of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and appears to have fallen out of print. It was never printed again, apparently, after the first time. In conclusion, I'd like to quote from a forthcoming life story by Ilan Papé. He says, or writes, the final station for me in this journey, journey of life, is my dream of establishing a physical center against Nekba denial in London. There are, quite, there, there are quite a few centers against Holocaust denial, and this is fine, but we need at least one against Nekba denial and to locate it in the capital of the past empire that enabled the 1948 ethnic cleansing of Palestinians and their subsequent oppression is surely appropriate. And that's the note on which I wish to end. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Rosemary. Um... There's a lot to think through there. Um, and with that, I'd like to move to Leila Parsons. I'm just going to share my screen. Um... And while you do that, I'll introduce you. Um, Leila Parsons is professor at McGill University where she teaches the history of the modern Middle East including the history of Palestine. She's ex published extensively on the 48 war, on rebel soldiers in the interwar period, and on the place of narrative and biography in the historiography of the modern Middle East. We're so delighted to have you with us, Leila. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, um, Mesna and um, Yael and Crash and to the archives of the Disappeared team um, for organizing this. Um, congratulations also to Diana Allen, and Mahmoud Zaydan for their incredible multi-year project, the Nakba Archive, and for this book that has come out of that project. I'm also so honored to be in this group discussion um, with Dr. Rosemary Saif. Um, I read her groundbreaking 1979 book, The Palestinians from Peasants to Revolutionaries, when I was an undergraduate in the UK studying Arabic in the mid to late 1980s. She was, as we know, one of the first scholars to recognize the importance of telling Palestinian history in English from the point of view of the Palestinian refugees themselves. Um, and her book had a really profound impact on me at the time. I also want to give a shout out to the translators um, of the oral histories contained in this book, Huda Adra, who's here today, and Raya mm. Badran. Um, they, they did an amazing job um, in bringing Palestinian voices to an English speaking audience. I teach Palestinian history here at McGill uh, in Montreal, and I'll be using this book in my classes in the years to come so that students are able to learn about the Nakba through the words of the people who experienced it. And to have these oral histories so beautifully and carefully translated into English allows me to do that as a teacher. So I'm here just because I'm one of the contributors to the book. I introduced the oral histories of three Palestinian men who fought in Palestine in 1948 in one of the chapters called Remembering the Fight. These are just three of the 750,000 Palestinians who were expelled from their homeland in 1948. So I'm gonna use my seven minutes to talk about these three men and to reflect on how listening carefully to their very particular oral histories deepens our understanding of the Nakba. In the last months of 1947, 
the British army started to pull out of Palestine after a military occupation that lasted 30 years. The British knew that what would follow their departure was a war between the indigenous population, the Palestinians, and the Yeshuv, the recently arrived Jewish settler community in Palestine. Kamil Balawi, Mahmoud Abu Heja, and Muhammad, and Muhammad um, Abu Rakaba were all young men living in northern Palestine in 1947. All three men organized themselves immediately to join the fight that was coming. Abu Raqaba joined an officer training camp in Qatana, Syria, where young men from all over the Arab world were being trained to lead companies into battle as part of the Arab League's volunteer army, Jaysh al Qaz, or Arab Liberation Army. Abu Heja helped organize fighting units from villages in the central Galilee, near the village of Sha'ab, located on the road between Akka and Safad. And Bel Airwi joined Jaysh al as an ordinary soldier and fought to defend the villages around Safad. Here is a photograph of him in his army, uni army uniform, sorry, from, uh, from that time, from um, his time as a soldier in Jaysh al -Nkhaz. The oral histories of these three men are replete with memories of the fighting. Abu Raqaba describes how the Haganah attacked Al Jalil, the Galilee, from the air, and bam, 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 instantly killed fighters who had no anti aircraft defenses. Bal Airwi tells of safely delivering the heavy muzzle of his unit's mortar to his commanding officer after hauling it over miles of rough terrain along with his rifle, blanket, and other supplies. Abul Heja distinctly recalls how they were able to procure British manufactured Bren guns, which helped them recapture the village of Birwa from Jewish forces in 1948. Their testimonies remind us of how hard Palestinians fought for their land. In the academic field of Nakba studies, the fighting itself is sometimes cast into shadow by the refugee story for very understandable reasons. All that has happened since tends to frame the Nakba because of course the Nakba is ongoing, an event that continues to evolve across generations as Diana Allen puts it, or as Mahmoud Zaydan puts it in his beautiful preface to the book, an event with a rumbling present. But if we put the Nakba for a moment in time, in the past, in 1948, and we listen closely to men like Abul Heja, Bel Airwi, and Abu Raqaba, we can feel ourselves fleetingly there with them as they struggle to defend their homeland. These three men survived that fighting to tell their story to us. They all ended up as refugees in Lebanon and lived into old age. Hence, we are able to watch them describe this, str this struggle into a video camera just three of the dozens and dozens of oral histories carried out by Diana Allen and Mahmoud Zaydan in the early 2000s. Of course, thousands did not survive to tell their stories. Thousands died in the fighting. Palestinians and ordinary volunteer soldiers who came from Morocco, Egypt, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, Syria, Yemen, and other places to Palestine to fight alongside the Palestinians. The names of these war dead, who were Balawi, Abu Heja, and Abu Raqaba's comrades in arms, are listed in the remarkable six volume Arabic Chronicle of the War, written in the 1950s by the Palestinian historian Arif al Arif, who himself lived through the events. The final volume of Arif al Arif's Chronicle is called Sijil al Khalud, Register of Everlasting Life. This is the frontispiece of Sijil al Khalud, and the opening page of the Register of the Dead, so carefully and precisely documented by Arif al Arif. Now, I hesitated about showing this first page of names, lest it seem too casual or too dis disrespectful. 
Um, these are the names of people with families who lost their lives in the war. And I'm very conscious of that as I put this slide up. But I wanted to honor RFLRF's painstaking, respectful historical work in recording their names, where they were from, and when and where they died. Strange, perhaps, to end a presentation on oral history with a textual source, but I think that sometimes our current academic preoccupation with setting up categories against each other, in this case, oral history versus textual history, precludes the possibility of generative connections that transcend those categories. Thousands of Palestinian men and many women fought hard in Palestine in 1948. Some survived that fighting, many did not. Bringing text and word together allows us to understand these three survivors, not only as refugees telling their stories about their past, but also as fighters who fought for their land at a particular moment in time, alongside thousands of others who lie there still today in mostly unmarked graves. Thank you so much, Leila. Um, I want to move on to Alex now. Alex Winder is a historian of Mandate Palestine based at uh, Brown University Center for Middle East Studies and he is an executive editor of the Jerusalem Quarterly. He edited and introduced between Yaffa and Mount Hebron, the diaries of Muhammad Abdel Hadi Shrouf, 1943 to 1962, published in 2016. We're so incredibly delighted to have you with us, Alex. Thank you, Mezna, so much. Uh, thank you, Mezna and Yael for the forum um, to speak. Um, thank you to Diana Allen and Mahmoud Zaydan, um, without whose tireless work, um, we wouldn't be here today. Um, and thank you to Leila Parsons and Rosemary Sayach, whose work is not only foundational, but inspirational. Um, and I'm so excited to uh, hear from Hoda af after me, because I think, and I encourage all of you to go to the Nakba archive and um, see the interviews for themselves. And, and I think it gives us also an appreciation of the difficulty of, of the work of the translators, Hoda and, and Raya, not only in translating Arabic to English, but in translating the um, cadence and, and music of um, spoken Arabic um, with its interruptions and changes of direction um, onto the written page, um, which is really an incredible work. Um, so I'm so appreciative to, to be able to um, join all of you here today. And also I see some uh, friendly names and faces in the audience. So thank you uh, everyone for joining us. Um, I also, kind of my own research, I, I don't have prepared remarks, but I'll, I'll say a little bit about how the Nakba archive and, and oral history affects my research, which is actually in the mandate period. So I think, you know, often we think of the Nakba as 1948 and, and kind of perhaps thinking about the, the kind of continuity of that moving forward. But I think also thinking about the way the Nakba has kind of shaped archives and, and resources for historians, thinking about the Mandate period and the Ottoman period as well. Um, so my chapter in, in uh, the volume is about Palestinians who served in the Palestine Police Force, which was the police force established by uh, the British Mandate in Palestine um, in 1920. Um, and I began this research um, actually looking at kind of archives of, of text. Um, I initially went to St. Anthony's College at, at Oxford, where they had recently put together um, an archive around the Palestine police, um, which included material from the British Empire and Commonwealth Museum, uh, as well as material collected by the Palestine Police Old Comrades Association, essentially a, a kind of community of, of Britons who had served in the police force in Palestine. And one of the things that was remarkable to me about visiting this archive was the absence of Palestinians um, almost completely uh, in, in the written sources from this period, the British sources in particular. Um, to the extent that they were kind of remarked upon, Palestinians were either 
abstracted as numbers. So we know how many hundreds uh, and, and eventually thousands of Palestinians served in the Palestine police force, or they were thought of as a problem. You know, how, how could the British count on Palestinians to be quote unquote neutral in serving the police force uh, uh, in the British mandate? Often concerns that were uh, heightened or, or kind of raised to the British by Zionists who were particularly uh, interested in using the police force to build up their own paramilitary and to kind of reduce the number of Palestinians uh, serving in the police. And one of the uh, uh, you know, difficulties of working with these sources, again, is, was the absence of Palestinians, but also there are multiple layers of erasure that I think are happening, not just the, the erasure um, of, of Palestinians from the sources, but even when we have uh, things like uh, Palestine police service record cards, which are very similar to the ID cards that, that Diana showed an image of earlier. Um, there's a way in which institutions like the police seek to um, render the individuals within them anonymous, to make them uniform, literally by putting them in uniforms, um, by making sure that they patrol the same routes every day and their police uh, uh, notebooks reflect that. Um, very formulaic, the idea that any policeman is the same as any other. And of course, one of the things that something like the, the Nakba archive and the oral history uh, of um, Palestinians who served in the police force allows us to see is the kind of wide variety of individuals who served in the police force, the different motivations they had for, for joining the police, um, their different relationship with the institution, how they saw their own role in relationship to this institution, which was in many ways um, the coercive arm of the of British uh, Empire in Palestine, but was also an opportunity for upward mobility for Palestinians um, seeking salaries, seeking education, um, thinking perhaps about um, what a future Palestinian state might be and their own role within it. And I think uh, through using the, the oral histories and through um, engaging with the oral histories, we're able to kind of break beyond a sort of schematic idea of this institution of the police and the politics associated with it, um, its repressive role in, in uh, um, really suppressing the great revolt of 1936 to 39, its role in building the foundations for the, for the Israeli police later, um, and thinking about Palestinians' engagement with it, which varied according to class, according to um, whether they were coming from rural areas or urban areas, according to ideas of, of masculinity um, that they held, uh, and uh, ideas of modernity and, and, um, and justice. Uh, a lot of the Palestinians serving in the police had a certain sense of justice, whether that aligned with British justice uh, or not. Uh, and in many cases, of course, it didn't. Um, and the oral histories that are included uh, in Voices of the Nakba um, that I wrote about kind of reflect the diversity of Palestinians who served in the police force and speak, I think, to the diversity of Palestinian experiences of the British mandate more generally. On the one hand, we have Ahmed uh, Aha, who uh, comes from a land-owning family. He goes to uh, St. Luke's School in Haifa, a prestigious school, and he's thinking to become a lawyer. And he joins the police force because he's kind of he sees uh, a, a police training, um, and he's kind of inspired by the sort of regimented masculinity that they embody, right? And so we can see how someone like this would perhaps see the police um, as a way to then entering into the law, a number of um, Palestinians who served in the police received legal training and went on to become lawyers, but also a certain kind of idea of um, the masculine, kind of a masculine modernity or modern masculinity. On the other hand, Omar Shahada is the, the second um, individual uh, whose oral history is included. He came from a peasant family and in many ways uh, the police force was an employment opportunity that was more lucrative and, you know, less demanding than working for meager pay in agricultural fields, right? And many of his kind of recollections are the ways in which he, as a, a, a policeman, sought to kind of work within the system uh, to kind of shape justice for Palestinians, whether it was kind of defending Palestinians who were being bullied by uh, uh, British officers, 
whether it was by kind of helping Palestinians um, surreptitiously remove uh, weapons before the police were going to search uh, the premises, the house that they were in, and so on. A different kind of imagination of justice uh, emerges through, through his narrative. Um, and I think uh, in closing, thinking about um, how these kinds of tensions, these kinds of complications continue to, to shape Palestinian lives. I think often when I'm you know, working with the oral histories or, or other sources about Palestinians who served in the Mandate Era police force, it, it helps me think also about Palestinians who are serving in the Palestinian Authority uh, security services, Palestinians who are, uh, or uh, you know, even beyond Palestine, thinking about Iraqis who are serving in the police force under U.S. occupation, uh, those who are serving in in police forces in the United States, um, and the kinds of decisions that are being made by people, the kinds of motivations that that aren't clear if we just kind of flatten our histories to to institutional histories, if we just look at numbers or if we look at those kind of official sources that are produced. Um, so I, I, again, kind of encourage everyone to read the book, but also to go to the archive itself and to, to appreciate the richness of, of Palestinian experiences and the complexity of those experiences. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, I, finally, we have Huda, Huda Adra. Are you here? Huda, Huda is a spoken word poet and filmmaker. She was born in Lebanon, raised in Saudi Arabia and adopted by Montreal. Um, <laughs> her practice is rooted in writing as resistance and self-inscription, employing vocal and somatic inquiry to explore aborted oral histories and the suppression of movement from female bodies. Huda? Hi. Uh, can you hear me with the, the, the earbuds? Yeah. Um, thanks for holding this discussion, um, Madna and Diana and everyone, Mahmoud. Um, thanks for um, also allowing me to work on these translations. Um, it's it's uh, uh, very big, uh, it was a very big experience, a personal experience too for me. Um, to be able to uh, to live with the, these voices and watch them recorded on video archive, as um, I believe many of them has passed uh, have passed as ancestors now. So, um, so I also thank mostly these voices that um, I I feel opened up a way be between me and them to be able to hopefully honor them uh, in. In some, in maybe an exact way that is not uh, Cartesian. <laughs> um, so um, to to be able to work on these translations, um, I spent a lot of time watching and listening, um, and uh, through a process of attunement and a willingness to to be affected and inhabited by these stories, um, their images, the images of. The, the interviewees um, sitting and talking uh, to the interviewer, the relationship between the interviewer and the interviewee. Um, I tried not to distance myself from the retelling of trauma, which uh, it's not an easy thing. Um, and um, trying also to decenter myself at the same time um, because of triggers and um, because um, I, I I mean, oral history and archiving in their purpose is to become transmissions, hopefully. And so um, it's important to keep in mind that we hope for an audience to be there and to receive hopefully the most direct transmission possible, even if um, there has to be a language uh, transition. And so there's a lot of, I feel like, um, transformations that have to happen and transductions between um, passing from an accounts that are um, co combined as image, video image, body presence and voice, um, going through uh, 
translators ears and eyes at the same time and being compounded and we re i guess um uh, how do you say like put out um as text and uh texts on a page uh, that has images embedded inside of it and hopefully sound um that sound can also stay and the orality can stay and um that uh, the la whatever people would call a lack is actually a proof and evidence of um, internalized uh, oppression, but not only that, but also a proof of uh, holding one's end of a story and um, bodies grounding themselves in a location that is no longer um, geographical, um, but it's still political and it's um, sonic and um, it is a, a way to keep inhabiting uh, land um, even through ongoing Nakba. Um, so I, I feel like more than the image for sure, the, the dynamism of the voice is it, to me uh, felt more powerful, but the image was, a, was an accompanying like support because um, you can see the, 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 I mean, the surroundings and sometimes family going in and out um, in the camp and you can see the aftermath of of the interviewees um, lives and where they're located now but then you're listening to a life that is no longer um, in this space that you're seeing them in so it's, that's the power in that too and um, there's a, a friend of mine who's a translator who who's who's in Montreal and her, her name is Olivia Tapiro and she was talking about um about translation as a place to develop an ethics um and uh, I guess there are many ethics to keep developing um and to me it was an ethics of relaying and and listening at once um to an invisible network of listeners and an anticipated audience um how do you receive through time because some of these vi videos are, are 20 years old um knowing that the vessel is the voice and um compounds the image the sound the presence the texture of the voice the psychosomatic signals that are visible and heard um because you there needs to be a sensitivity and a certain hyper vigilance to how sometimes uh, stories are recounted like an accordion, like some some events might be, to pe some people might be small events of, of the everyday mundane, but in the way they're told, they're, they magnify. And then some stories that are, stories, that are holding, holding lots of holding trauma. Lots of trauma. Oh, I'm hearing myself twice. I'm hearing myself twice. You too? Is that good? Yeah. Um, some stories that hold lots of trauma are very succinctly described. And so uh, the question that I was asking myself is, what do I look for in, inside the voice and how does it reverberate in the body, like somatically as body language through hesitation, repetition, sometimes memory loss, fragmentation, avoidance of telling certain uh, certain pieces of information or certain accounts that are emotional um, uh, and that sometimes can be replaced with pride that also signifies other parts of, of the story um, which yeah which is a form of resistance to um, segueing from one story to another that seemingly don't have any link but you it gives you information of about like the subconscious uh pathways that link stories together and that is very geographical in its own way too um self-censorship um minimizing or aggrandizing um uh events grief and um and the willingness to talk and the willingness to be present and uh the willingness also to to expose oneself uh, 
knowing, hoping, I, I guess. And um, so, yeah, I, 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 I can't speak for it myself, but I know there's, <laughs> I know that's what it, what it feels like. Um, and my question in a way was if voice can be used as a, as in lie detector machines, then can voice be used as a truth detector? Um, truth, what it's being bypassed through history, like history with a capital H and history, like historical facts, uh, when in whoever is writing in universities, whoever has the power to write, you know, the, the most, um, I mean, who has the politics to write, to write the stories that are prevalent, that are, um, that are hiding uh, some bodies, then where, it, where in these bodies are, are those truths revealed? Um, where they're bypassed, can, they, can you see them through these archives as uh, internalized wounding or psychic inhabiting of one's land both happening at the same time and can this evidence then become serve as evidence for crimes against humanity and how can we as a collective become a, a society that that can um, the, evolve towards that towards being able to see vulnerability but also strength in exposing vulnerability as a proof of existence as proof of having gone through experience and trauma. Um, so that's what I learned uh, from translating. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm very thankful for this experience. And I hope, yeah, I hope, um, I hope the voices reach you uh, more than in your ears too. Thank you so much, Huda. Um, and it's really, this is really incredible um, reflection on something that is less regarded, um, less thought through about how oral histories and really um, interviews and more broadly the research ethics around translation. So um, that was really, really helpful. Um, okay, so what I thought to do is to open it up for questions, clarifications, anything that, um, anyone has in mind um, and I you you know you can you can ask the question in the chat or you can ask uh, you can raise your hand and I'm more than happy to call on you um, maybe I'll start I have so many questions I'm really sorry and it's you know and I, I want to sort of center this by congratulating you all on this incredible effort and um, book and and to sort of remind everyone and I think Leila you mentioned it as well what an incredible teaching resource I think this will be um, in different kinds of courses and classes and spaces including community spaces and organizing spaces where you know you might have conversations around Palestine but it's very often that Palestinian voices somehow end up being on the margins of those conversations. So this is an opportunity to bring them back to the center in, um, in, in all sorts of really um, um, productive and um, um, powerful ways. Um, okay, so maybe, well, actually Benjamin has a question. Um, so I guess I'll just start with the Q and A and I'll save mine for a bit later. Um, so he asks, what do you consider the long-term effects of the Nakba are on uh, Palestinian or Palestinian or the Palestinian Lebanese psyche? I'm not, who would like to answer something like that? Mahmoud? Mahmoud, you should answer. Yeah. That. <laughs> Mahmoud. You're muted, Mahmoud. Yes, hello. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know. I uh, I can speak simply uh, uh, that this uh, uh, that the impact is on 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 identity. You know, like the, uh, 
the, the Nakba has marked the identity of Palestinian refugees. And again, like uh, uh, Palestinian and Lebanese, because you know, uh, uh, Palestinian refugees in Lebanon uh, have different and very like uh, difficult, if you want, uh, experience than all other, those who are in Lebanon, than all others who want to the neighboring uh, host countries like Syria, Jordan, or West Bank or Gaza. Uh, the long-term uh, effects is that of disposition, that of uh, injustice, that of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't find the word like, you know, like uh, sometimes Lebanese ask themselves, why, why do we have to, uh, uh, let's say, experience all this suffering and all this injustice and all this like uh, Palestinians or uh, the feeling of Palestinians having as again, this long waiting for uh, UN resolutions to be implemented like the right of return or let's say uh, uh, solving their problem uh, and having let's say this, uh, what we see in uh, Ukraine or other places of the world the international uh, community intervened to solve the problem and uh, uh, let's say uh, intervening uh, uh, oppositely on the Palestinian context not to solve the problem. I think this feeling of uh, dismay or feeling of uh, betrayal or feeling of uh, being uh, left or, or uh, uh, ignored is the long-term uh, impact. I don't know if I answered the question, but this is this is my part. Thank you, Mahmoud. Um, Shay. Thank you so much um, for this really wonderful uh, collection and these um, really fascinating comics. I, I wanted to ask uh, Rosemary Sire a question that I was always curious about. Um, if she can take us back a little bit to the time that she conceived of her oral history project, and if you know maybe some of the others who were writing uh, around the same time, I was wondering um, if she, you know, were familiar at the time with, you know, writings of Gramsci or E.P. Thompson or, you know, what often is called sort of cultural Marxism, or were there other um, reasons or, or thoughts or or the way that she um, thought about um, going about collecting these testimonies and and writing them in, in this really amazing way that she did. I have to confess that I was <clears throat> very um, unacademic. I, I wasn't actually teaching in university at that point. And I didn't have um, clear ideas about, well, I didn't have really quite academic questions about what could be done with Palestinian refugee narratives. My reactions were very personal. I, I went to UNRWA as a journalist to try and find out why there were Palestinian camps in Lebanon. And I found that their material only told me what UNRWA was doing for the Palestinians, not why they had come, or where they had come from. And it was this kind of bafflement or mystery that led me into the camps to find out from people themselves why they were here. And then I got, you know, the stories of, it, it would have been better to have died in Palestine than to come here. This is what, how so many of the older people started their stories. And to be quite honest, it was actually that I liked Palestinians. I liked the way they spoke. It was a very personal and emotional reaction, um, far more than like academic, academic questions of were these accounts to be trusted? What were they really trying to do? I just took it that they were talking to me as a Britisher about 
hoping perhaps that I would communicate their story to this government far away, which had created such terrible um, fate for them. And this in fact was what I was very happy to do when I first started writing, to be a messenger. And things got more complicated later on. But you were asking about the beginning, so that's what I've done. Thank you. Um, I actually, you know, I thought maybe I could follow up that question with um, one of my own, which was one of the things that I find fascinating about this archive as well as the collection was, um, you know, it is it is a his, it is a collection from Lebanon of Palestinians in Lebanon, and I try to imagine what a Nakba archive, much more expansively, mm -hmm. with a much more expansive remit, would look like. Sort of um, taking heed of Mahmoud's um, gesture around, um, you know. Um, documentation, as it were, and its role as documentation. Um, and I, so, so part of me is wondering if, if Diana or anyone would like to sort of reflect on what are the specific conditions you thought in Lebanon made an archive like this possible? Mm -hmm. And what would an archive like this look like or an attempt to do an archive like this look like in a place like Syria or Jordan? or Iraq, you know, of Palestinians in Iraq, um, or anywhere else really. It is singular in that way. Um, and so many of these Nakba archives, I mean, there's material in from the West Bank for sure, and for Palestinians in Israel, but um, yeah. Yeah, that's a really, um, a really uh, important question. I mean, I don't know, it's hard for me to kind of contemplate that having not, you know, my all my work has been in Lebanon, and I feel like I don't know, um, you know, these other contexts well enough. I mean, I think it, when we started this project, we, we had very modest, kind of a very modest um, ambitions. Uh, you know, it was initially, we didn't have any funding initially, and it was just, um, you know, it was just me and Mahmoud uh, with Mahmoud's car and one camera and we were driving around and and then the scale of it, you know, I, didn't, I think when we started it, we didn't sort of imagine it as an archive in the way that it has sort of evolved, it, you know, as a kind of something that feels more, you know, what one, ima what one would imagine an archive to be. Um, the scale was kind of much, yeah, was, was, was much more modest. Um, and you know, I mean, clearly, as you as you were sort of gesturing to, I think we we had we had access. Maybe I think the access, the the, the capacity to do this project was um, was you know obviously a lot was logistically easier, and the fact that it was really a project that has been conducted entirely by refugees. It wasn't. I was the only non-Palestinian working on this project, and it was through. You know, initially through Mahmoud's networks, and then through the refugee researchers who worked on worked with us in these communities as the project grew. Um, and you know, I know that. I mean, we did actually. We wanted to extend the project to Syria, and then um, didn't have access. And Mahmoud, if you want to kind of join in, because you were, you know, you can speak to this too. Because um, we tried to do that through the um, through the Al Auda group, um, and we. You know, and then didn't get we didn't get get permission to do any interviews. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think, as you're saying, uh, you know, I think clearly there's a need for for you know for 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 some kind of you know a project that brings all these different disparate um, initiatives together and gathers these these um, interviews in one. In one place, or I know Rosemary. I was just reading your yesterday. I was reading the the piece that you published in the Journal of Holy Land Studies, 
um, Holy Land and Palestine studies. And uh, you were saying, you know, the, the, the importance of, of even just creating an inventory of everything that's been done everywhere, which I think is really important because such that doesn't exist still. Um, but what what a project like this would look like elsewhere in Syria, I I don't I don't know. Ad Mahmoud, do you want to join in? And uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you answered Diana. In fact, I can uh, just link the uh, to answer the question of uh, uh, my uh, what makes, let's say, uh, this unique in Lebanon or or that the experience of people, it's very rich and uh, and again, like uh, being from uh, I I was born in Ain al Helwi camp. So finding people and getting to talk to people or even in other camps is, uh, is easy, easier than let's say Diana or someone who's uh, uh, like a foreigner coming with a camera to uh, sit for an hour and sometimes sleeping uh, in, in places that are uh, like in Bika or in North. So I think, I think, uh, 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 the difficulty was in Syria because uh, getting uh, permission from the regime to enter from outside with the camera and as again like uh, getting to get the trust of people in Syria was not easy. So maybe we didn't uh, find, uh, let's say, good partners to develop a partnership that they can do it because you know, having someone from the community, and this was our, let's say, uh, methodology can help a lot because people mm -hmm. trust and can speak easily. Uh, but this doesn't mean we don't have challenges as, as my, my ask, because in Lebanon, for example, there are checkpoints on the uh, entrance of camps. So we were lucky because we had a small camera that can sometimes be hidden or we it, it is not noticed sometimes we if you remember Diana I think once I was in Burj Shamali camp and the uh, soldier saw the camera and he said are you a journalist I said no no I am not a journalist this is a small camera so he said it's okay but then when he saw the tripod he said ah this is for broadcasting then he went and called the officer and had a long discussion and like prevented me to enter. So the problem is, as I said, like uh, 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 having difficulty uh, on access to refugees, having difficulties sometimes uh, uh, to convince people to speak. And uh, again, uh, the, the richness of experiences or multiple experiences in Lebanon sometimes uh, uh, was positive because people want to speak and sometimes it was uh, difficult because people wouldn't want to speak what they want. And yani some, uh, if you remember Diana M. Aziz from Burj al Barajni, she had like six sons who disappeared in 1982. They, 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 she believes she's, they are still alive. So it's not easy to talk about Kwikat in Palestine 74 years ago while she has lived with all this obsession of looking and finding her, her children. So the, the, and the idea is here, I mean, again, uh, this was unique because in other areas, the Palestinian refugees did not have these distractions or uh, difficulties if you win their trust to speak. The Palestinians in Jordan, for example, or they, they don't have the problems uh, of talking like in Lebanon, whether even, even to reach them or to, to, to get their uh, uh, trust was easy because in, in Lebanon, sometimes people uh, are afraid to speak. They might think their children abroad will be uh, impacted or uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, yeah, and they, they will suffer if they speak, even if their children are in Germany or in England or wherever. And in, 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 uh, uh, on the other hand, if you, for example, uh, 
do this project in Jordan or in Syria, you will have different villages because uh, we, we, I mean, we don't have representatives of all villages uh, in Palestine, in Lebanon. So some villages like Deir Yassin or Tantura, or they, you can find them in Syria, and the same you can find in Jordan, villages that are not in Lebanon. This is why there is a need to do exactly the same documentation as, as, as soon as possible if you still find people who are able to speak uh, in all e these different areas so that you complement the, the story or the history of Palestinian refugees. Thank you so much, Mahmoud. Um, Maria Birnbaum? Yes, um, thank you so much for this. This was incredibly, um, incredibly humbled by the work that you've done and, and the, the extent of, 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 of time and resources you've put into this. So I'm very much looking forward to exploring both the archive and the, and the publications. I have um, a question about the conversations and the, the, the context and the, the content of the conversations that you, that you had in the interviews and the experience that you capture um, about these particular events. Uh, and the particular um, sort of time period in the late 1940s. And I was wondering <clears throat> if there are any, um, any references um, that are made to, um, to events that are not, not local, not in Palestine or in Lebanon, but on uh, that reference um, this to other events taking place at the, at the same time. So I'm thinking here in particular at other parts of, of, uh, the, of the British sort of uh, decolonization, so particularly about India. Are there any references um, made to, to, to India or to other conflicts taking place at the, at the same time? Or are these conversations um, always about um, the the geographical sort of um, immediate uh, location um, itself. So Palestine, the state of Israel that is uh, coming about um, um, in Lebanon and so forth. Um, I, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of, of interviews that do um, reference events that are going on elsewhere in, in um, British Empire. Um, I don't know if, uh, I mean, I don't know, um, you know, I, it, the, 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 the interview, the interview, the interviews, many of them do kind of weave in, obviously through discussion of the um, Arab Liberation Army through Jay Shilinkar, draw in, you know, other contexts in the Middle East where, where with, with soldiers coming in Jordan and so on. But I don't know if, if, um, if either Alex or Layla, maybe you would want to respond to this through the, did, I don't think any of the, the interviews that you, that you discuss address it's very, I mean, the focus is very much on, um, you know, 1948, the lead up to 1948, uh, and then the immediate aftermath. And we consciously kept the, the temporal frame very, very tight. We don't, we don't really discuss, for instance, um, uh, you know, what happened in the 1950s in Lebanon, which is what we want to actually start doing now um, to do kind of more, more work on, um, on the sort of history of exile in, in Lebanon. But, uh, I think that, that that temporal frame, we, we intentionally kept it very tight. And um, so... Yeah, I, 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 it's also very focused, isn't it, on the experience of the, of the Nakba or the experience of living in Palestine before the Nakba, the way the interviews are structured. Yeah. It wouldn't necessarily invite that kind of um, roaming beyond that very, you know, strongly experienced context. Certainly in the Arab Liberation Army ones, um, there is, there's a lot of mention of the other Arab states, um, not necessarily the ones that, are, that I did in the book, but there are other videos. Um, I've forgotten the name of the man, Diana, but the, he has those wonderful songs about Jason and Carve, a very critical. Oh, yeah. Um, really funny, really funny 
better songs, which are which are um, full of references to Iraqi commanding officers, and um, because there's a huge amount of anger, of course, mm-hmm. towards the um, towards the leaders of the Arab states, and particularly some of the top commanding officers of the Arab state armies um, um, amongst the Palestinian refugees. But I can't think of anything really more than that um, from the videos yeah. that I've watched. I mean, I think also because, you know, I think what we wanted to do was, you know, to to really document as much as possible what life was like in these communities. So we have very, we, you know, as Mahmoud was saying, we kind of developed a, a questionnaire that centered on childhood and education and work and family relations and these kinds of these kinds of issues. Uh, and so I think the the stories and the 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 information we've collected really cohere around those around those themes um and i think also the fact that you know most of the you know many vast majority of the people we interviewed were were farmers whose you know stories and life worlds are very much oriented around around rural you know rural life um and so again it doesn't sort of you know, these kinds of events wouldn't have necessarily been, you know, things happening elsewhere wouldn't have been necessarily part of the stories that they would be, that they would be telling. Just to add to that. Sorry, sorry, Alex, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I mean, I think one of the, in many ways, the kind of geographies that emerge in in the narratives are the geographies of lived experience. So people's, you know, in many ways, it also kind of helps us rethink this kind of abstracted geography of Palestine. I mean, most of the people who are interviewed hadn't been necessarily to all of Palestine. I mean, they, they'd kind of been in their village, they'd maybe been in the large cities. Um, and one of, the, I don't think it's uh, either of the policemen uh, who are uh, included in, in the volume, but, you know, I remember a, a, a policeman, an interview with a, a former uh, policeman who remembers going to Khan Yunus in, in, in Gaza and, and tasting the most delicious watermelons he'd, he'd ever eaten, right? So, and this is the kind of, you know, I think in some ways, this is the scale on which people are living and also remembering their experiences, not necessarily kind of thinking um, or, or talking so much about kind of broader geopolitics, but but I think, you know, the, the, the new experiences even of traveling from, say, Ramallah to Khan Yunus and, and what that meant in terms of the new kinds of experiences and new horizons that were opening for them just in traveling within Palestine. I, I just like to add, uh, and confirming your point, Alex, but we have, I, I still remember like two interviews, one for somebody called Saleh al Nasser. Uh, this guy was deported to Iraq. So in, again, he's talking about his experience. He was deported to Iraq. And I think someone who went to fight with the British in Libya or something like this, I remember. So again, they are talking about their experience in, in, yeah, with either the police or uh, uh, being like deported out of Palestine and how they return back and the uh, suffering they experience, etc. So but not that context that you asked, Maria. Um, so I have a question actually, maybe directed more broadly at everybody, but um, it's about form and about these as video recordings versus earlier materials that, you know, like Rosemary referenced and also Rosemary's work that is more written oral histories. And especially Alex and Leila, um, but everyone else, for you as historians or scholars that think about the Nakba, think about the pre-Nakba, post-Nakba history of Palestine, was there a difference for you? And what, like, what were you thinking through when you were watching video or audio or versus earlier materials that you may have, um, that you, I know that you use that is more um, written? And I ask this precisely because I think um, I do, one of the conversations that we constantly have in Archives of the Disappeared and, and we explore really in a lot of depth in different spaces and ways is what documentation can and uh, do um, and what it can't do. Um, and where it, you know, uh, I mean, this is a Nakba archive of survivors of the Nakba, right? 
And I'm interested in thinking about then what documentation of survivors in Mecca, like inform what it does. And Huda, I mean, this also speaks to you, I think, in what you're trying to talk about in terms of then how do you translate these different forms um, into another language, um, which is its own um, sort of process. And I'm thinking about this especially, and I just sort of want to put this out there, is I think, you know, now we're, we're Palestinian historians or, you know, historians of Palestinians, not necessarily Palestine, but historians of Palestinians are facing this reckoning about the um, how to write histories after the Nakba um, and what that would likely entail um, in terms of form and method and um, um, sets of questions and all, you know, all sorts of things. And, you know, I mean, it's sort of interesting that this, the Nakba archive offers us methods to then translate, as it were, into these other um, periods. But also I'm wondering if there's something specific to the Nakba that produces certain kinds of oral histories. So actually that's many questions in one, but I just, I'm throwing them out there in this kind of way because I think that they're just different pieces of method and research practice and um, historiographical sets of problems. Um, for post Nakba historians, at least, that um, that this archives offers solutions to, but also challenges to. Um, so I just want to throw that out there, and maybe I can I can just start. Yeah. I hope I won't ramble on for too long, so I'll try to keep it short. The first the first thing I wanted to say is that Diana's introduction for those of you in the audience who, who haven't read it yet to this book, really stands alone as a brilliant kind of reflection on the question of embodied history, you know, what, what the videos can do for us in terms of really rethinking what we mean by history. So I really would encourage everyone to, to read that introduction because it's, it's the latest word, I think, kind of on this tension between embodied history through these um, videos and what we would think of as more traditional kind of history. I've been thinking about this question quite a bit and I don't have any very co coherent thoughts, um, but as a historian, I'm an empirical historian committed to the power of narrative to do a certain kind of political work in the world, um, narrative history. Um, and I can certainly draw on these interviews in quite powerful ways to incorporate into a narrative of a certain moment in time, let's say a certain battle, um, a, certain, um, uh, a certain expulsion um, in 1948. I can see exactly how I could draw on these narratives to um, these videos to kind of make a much deeper, much more nuanced, much more human, um, dense, densely narrated history in, in the conventional sense. But for me, it's very important to actually put that into conversation with textual sources. Because for me, it's about telling a story, a kind of, com a kind of integrated story of what happened. Uh, and then the challenge becomes, how do you move between the textual sources and sources like these video interviews without uh, allowing the textual sources to, to naturally dominate in some way as they tend to do. So you really need a kind of method or a, um, you know, a craft that perhaps grounds these oral histories um, or makes the oral histories the position from which the narrative gets related, if that makes sense. I, I, I've been thinking about this a little bit but again, as an empirical historian and having worked on 48 for many years and having written an article against Benny Morris's absurd thesis that the Palestinian refugee crisis was born of uh, war and not by intent, um, you know, you can actually go also to these videos um, just to prove people like Morris wrong. And in fact, 
the video of Miriam Uthman from Hossein El Hosseiniya. Um, if you go to her video and you watch it carefully, it's a, it's a it's a difficult video to watch. It's a you know full of trauma, um, but it's a very very interesting video, and it completely contradicts Morris's kind of um, scientific chart. I, uh, you know, I am starting to talk too much now, but um, in his book um, about um, that particular village and uh, why the Palestinians left, because he has this kind of categorization for each village, you know, where he's trying to basically prove that there was no Israeli policy in 1948 to expel the Palestinians. So you can also use it for that. You can, you know, you can use it to, and I like the idea of it being used for that too, you know. Um, there's a lot more to say about this question, but uh, I'm going to stop talking now and let other people talk. Maybe I'll, I'll say a word or two. I mean, my thoughts are also kind of all over the place and not um, coherently formed. But I think one of the things for me thinking, and that came out while looking at the, the videos that I used for you know, my introduction in, in this um, collection, is thinking about the way these experiences are embodied and the way you know for the police in particular you know i mentioned this in my remarks but i think this there's a, a way in which there's the institution itself seeks to produce a certain kind of embodied experience of a policeman um and that these individuals both kind of bear the experience of that attempt to shape Palestinian bodies in particular kinds of ways, but they also kind of show the incomplete project of reshaping Palestinian bodies that the British mandate sought to um, achieve. Um, it helps us, for me, think about what kind of, um, because it also comes up in, in the interviews themselves, ideas of, of gender and, and particularly kind of masculinity, right, for how, how are these men who are being interviewed about their police experience, talking about the way they relate that experience to the idea of being men. How are they representing themselves bodily as, as men? How are they presenting a certain kind of masculinity um, in the interview? And I think, you know, to Leila's point also, I, and, and I think also um, touching on what Hoda said earlier, I think thinking about these like using these videos can also help us rethink other kinds of sources. You know, when when you're confronted with a with a video where someone takes a long pause, it's it affects you in a certain kind of way. Whereas if you're if you're reading a diary and you know someone takes a break for a week but just picks up where they left off, it's not experienced in the same kind of way reading that. You have to kind of notice that all right, they took a break of writing in their diary for a week. But it helps you think, you know, why did they, why do people take breaks from writing in their diaries? What it is, what is it that prevents them from writing in that moment? Is it connected to that thing that prevents someone from responding to a question or completing a story when they're being videotaped um, and, and asked to retell it? And so I think, you know, it's not, again, kind of as, as Leila pointed out, right? It's not just about, you know, the, this collection kind of, uh, of oral histories and, and how that kind of helps us rethink oral history. It's, it's how it kind of helps us rethink all of the sources that are available for us, all of the archives that are there, um, and really challenges us to think about the Palestinians themselves who are um, present in those archives, whether as producers of archives, whether as kind of records in the archives and so on. Um, wow, thank you so much, everyone. I am cognizant of time. We only have a few more minutes. And um, um, I, I think one of the things actually I was thinking about when reading your chapter, Alex, is something that I think you're also raising here that's really quite powerful is that, we, you know, what does it mean to also interview people who are talking about sometimes awkward things and awkward roles they held before the mandate as well. Um, that speaks to, I think, a question Basima has asked me in, um, through direct message, so I'm just going to read it to her because it's me thinking about the post-Nakba post histories. Um, and she asks, 
uh, I have a question. Did the interviewees mention anything about family members abroad, including um, Americas or other countries who were prevented from returning to unite with their families in Palestine? And with regard to the inventory Rosemary Sayyaf mentioned, would this inventory include oral history of the Palestinian refugees scattered around the world, like Europe, Latin America, and Asia? Um, I want to add to that, that one of the, my experiences has always been that the power of these kinds of audiovisual uh, archives is also giving um, <clears throat> interviewee an opportunity, like space in ways to just as, as powerfully written about by Diane and others about sort of the silence telling, saying something um, about experience and non-experience and what they would desire to be visible and non-visible. Um, and it's, especially as this in a project like this expands territorially, um, geographically, temporally, some of those, you know, the, the, the tight remit of war does something for this archive that expanding will transform. And that is about what kinds of questions we can ask and not ask, what kind of questions endanger in particular ways, um, questions of complicity change, questions of violence, relations to violence, relations to fascism with different political movements in situ and where people are, you know. Um, my work with Palestinian refugees from Iraq <laughs> really spoke to this set of questions, for example, um, or thinking about Palestinians and their role in Latin America and their role to movements both on the left and on the right. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I, I think that, that I, I would like, to, I was wondering if there could be a sort of sense of reflection around um, a book like this called Voices of the Nakba um, and a living history of Palestine and thinking about the living bit and the ongoing bit of Nakba and Palestine. And, um, and the power it offers, it, you know, it, it's, it's most power offering um, for me at least is this sort of roadmap um, that is tense, you know, it's not, complete, but it does gesture to experience, a really deep experience and a, and a, and a fabulous citation of earlier attempts as Rosemary pointed out by Palestinians and, other, and others um, to record the experience of the war. Rosemary, did you wanna ask, you had something to say? Not really, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I, I did want to kind of open it up for any um, final thoughts, um, any answers to Basma's question, or even May's question, um, although she, no, I think Mahmoud answered hers, so okay, so that's, that's all right. Um, thanks for, it's been a great, great meeting, I just wanted to say that quickly. I yes. really want to thank you for organizing it. it it's, I didn't say it at the beginning, but I say it now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mesna. Thank you all. Thank you for this wonderful um, book, for working on it for all these decades of incredible, powerful labor. And um, I know that it's going to kind of spread far and wide. I'm going to do my best to, to make that happen um, and, and for giving us a sense of what is possible um, with oral history. Thank you all so much. Thank you to Cambridge Festival for hosting us. Um, please go all. to the website of the Cambridge Festival to see other events that will be happening all around the city on many different topics in the arts and sciences and humanities. Um, it's a real pleasure to have all you here. Ramadan Kareem. And uh, um, I hope to see you all in person soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.